Right. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah somebody at the back says, no, I'd gladly change places with somebody who can't. <laughs> Old joke, but it's from the uh, Jim McGlade joke book, that one. Uh, second edition. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I normally bring it with me, but I haven't got it this time, so I had to ask Jim for a joke to start off with. Uh, it's about Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, or her shack, my shack, and a bungalow. That's it, Jim, isn't it? Yeah. One way to... I think that's how you teach kids, that one. Right, OK. Slight problem. I've not brought a watch and the clock stopped. So you're in for a long haul. <laughs> it's all right, but according to that, it's quarter to ten, so I've plenty of time. Oh, dear me. Right, OK. Fascinating. Um, Daniel, one of the most fascinating, I would say, one of the most remarkable stories in the Old Testament. Um, half of Daniel is about history, and the other half, approximately, is about prophecy. And the prophecy is not just short-term prophecy, but it's long-term prophecy as well. It's picked up with, uh, by the saints and teachers of Jesus, and it's further underlined by what we read in Revelation by John the Divine and other teachings of Paul in between. So it's quite a powerful book. Needless to say, scholars and critics would love to denounce it and to ridicule it even and to say that it never happened and it's a myth which is not true it took place on the plains of dura and even today there's a canal called the dura canal in that part of ancient babylon as it was it's a story of faith hope and endurance we're looking at chapter 3 now, just chapter 3. I'm not going to tread on anybody else's sermon or anything else in chapter 4 or 5 or whatever. That's somebody else's business. Leave that to Jim when we get to the awkward bits about prophecy. <coughs> it's, uh, we've got three characters in this story. We've got Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, and they were originally called, their Hebrew names, Ananiah, Mishael and Azariah, as Ellie pointed out with so, so the background work that she did a couple of weeks ago. So we're looking at now at about 30 years onwards from, well, sorry, about 15 to 20 years onwards from the last chapter where about, where Jim did his bit. Uh, so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are about 30 years of age now. They came into Babylon, they were dragged into Babylon as a result of uh, the uh, Nebuchadnezzar's invasion of Jerusalem and the story that's been uh, mentioned before anyway in previous messages. They were taken into Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar creamed off all the best of the best and left the rest and his plan was to re-educate to re-educate, to brainwash. So he gave, first thing he did was to give them new names. He failed to realise that a lot of people like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego had been schooled in the Hebrew way of life, the theology of Yahweh and the faith of Yahweh, the one God, the faith of the Lord God of Israel and so on. That was deeply rooted in their heart and that was not going to shift. It's not going to happen. It's not happening. Okay, so did it exist? Did all this stuff exist? Did the place? I'm just going to back to some of the biblical evidence because whenever I talk to non-believers, skeptics, and doubters, the, all the first thing they throw at me is, "Well, do we know it happened?" This sort of thing. Is there any evidence? Well, there is evidence. There's lots of evidence. Apparently, if we read what we've just read in chapter in the first part. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were considered, they were given some kind of high or prominent position. We get that impression and we get it later on as well. And some years ago there was a discovery of a 
five-sided prism that's actually in the Istanbul Museum there and it's a five-sided clay column and it talks about it's actually the text is written about Nebuchadnezzar's building projects it comprises of the names of Babylon's top court officials which we reading about here we read about them it mentions the sat traps the rat traps as the if it's not rat traps they were, they were probably you know, not nice people, but the satraps were people who uh, the, uh, the the king or the ruler had given uh, power over certain provisions, prov providences, provinces in his in his uh, great domain, which Babylon was a vast empire at the time. It mentions all this, and it also mentions it mentions the court officials and everything, but it also mentions a character called Arida Nabu, who was translated Abednego, Abednego number one it's also more also in the plain of dura the critics by the way they scoff at this one you know about the tower because they think that well it's it's stupid it's impossible because something like that 90 feet tall and by about 10 to 9 feet diameter would fall over structurally it's not a good idea well a simple answer is have you ever seen nelson's column which apparently is 170 feet high by 10 feet wide and that's still up there with old Nelson on the top and a few pigeons to go with him All right. so uh, apparently then this, uh, this is uh, quite possible but the pedestal part they said well it would have to have a big pedestal big pedestal to stand on okay in 1850 a French uh, um, archaeologist Jules Aupair he discovers six miles south of Babylon on the plains of Dura, next to the Dura Canal, a brick-built, 14 metres square by 6 metres high, brick-built plinth platform, which was there for some reason in the past. Interesting. OK, later on, another archaeologist discovered the remains of a furnace in that area. And on it was in it within its its, its workings. What they discovered was what they call cuneiform inscription, which was some of the ancient writing of the early Babylonians. And it it claimed this that such furnaces, although they were furnaces for smelting of of, of iron ore, okay, and uh, other stuff, it was also designated for blasphemers of the gods to be burned. Now, how much more evidence do we need than that? That this, If you want a good book on stuff like this, a guy called Bill Cooper, Dr. Bill Cooper, who has spent his lifetime looking at the authenticity of the books of the Bibles, including Genesis, was one of his early ones. Okay. So they were prisoners of war, and they understood the law and the prophets, and when they were forced to embrace something contrary to what their conscience and personal relationship with the Lord uh, was, it was therefore hostile. It was a hostile imposition. It was a hostile imposition. I think about our world today and how Christians are sometimes threatened with a hostile imposition. So, okay, let's have a look at, let's just carry on with the script. It's a long piece to, to get through, this is, because I want to get through the entire chapter so you see the picture as well as uh, the first few verses. It more or less split it up into about three or four parts. What happens is after this, we know that um, we get to the bit where Shadrach, Meshach are eventually punished and thrown into the furnace. But before we get there, let's have a little look. He says, therefore, at a certain time, there were Chaldeans, certain Chaldeans that came forward and accused, uh, they, they accused some of the Jews of not kowtowing to this um, image, this golden image that, by the way, was probably the actual image on the top of the column or the tower was overlaid with, quite possibly it was a wooden image overlaid with gold. That was probably one of the ways how they did things like this. And it probably represented the god Marduk, which was a creation god, which was a creation god of the early Babylonians, and one of the off-splinters of the, of the uh, 
creation god Marduk was a god called Nebo. Nebo, hence how it fits into the name Nebuchadnezzar. So the lesser god Nebo was the god of wisdom, the god of wisdom, culture, art, science and protector of territory. Interesting that one. So that's one of the reasons why they had to worship this image. So there were, okay, there were certain Chaldeans and they, uh, they spoke to Nebuchadnezzar O oh, king, live forever. Oh, don't they grovel. O oh, mighty king, live forever. You, O oh, king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the psaltery, the symphony, and all kinds of music must fall down to the image. And whoever does not do this will be thrown into the midst of the fiery furnace. If you've got your Bibles, we're on chapter 3, verse 12. There are certain Jews whom you set over the affairs of the province of the Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, they have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods. Or the god of worship, the golden image that you've set up. Who oh, aren't they snidey little... Uh, yeah, yeah, you can just imagine, oh, mighty king, we behave. You know, we do what we're supposed to, but they don't. Then Nebuchadnezzar... In rage and fury, he's got a short fuse, this bloke has. In rage and fury gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke to them saying, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, that you don't serve any gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you're ready... At the time, you hear the sound of the flute, harp, lyre, psaltery and symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down to worship the image which I have made, I'll be fine, I'll be good. So that's good. In other words, I'll give you another chance, you know. But if you do not worship, you will be cast immediately into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who, then, who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Who's going to save you then? Okay? Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king, We have no... They said to the king this, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer this you in this matter. That's an interesting approach. None of this, O oh, wonderful king, you great big marvellous person and all this sort of grovel, grovel, grovel. No, they went straight in there. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, hi, hey up, Neb, listen here. You know, they've got nothing to lose. A bit like going up to King Charles and saying, now then, Charlie, just sit down, let's have a natter. Oh, who, who, do they, who, who, do they, who do they think they are? If this is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. It's a bold statement, isn't it? But if not, if not, and this is where, this is the pivot in the whole message. If not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up. In other words, it's not happening. It's not going to happen, Nebu, Nebuchadnezzar. Sorry, we ain't doing it. Our God will, serve, will, will save us. We believe that. We have faith to believe he is able. He is able. But if not, if not, we're still not bowing down. It's not happening. It's not going to happen. Bad notes now. When there are times, and this is the message, one of the me this is the message for us, for the world, for Christians today. When there are times when a king or ruler, power or government, imposes a secular law which is in direct violation to the law of God, then we must always obey the higher law of God, whatever the consequences. That's the pivot of the message. That's the message for all time. 
that's the message for us. We spend a lot of time praying for people in parts of the world that are suffering some terrible persecution. We support Barnabas Fund, Janet and I, we have daily readings and we look and pray into what's happening in parts of the world. North Korea, one of the worst places on earth to be a Christian. I don't know how I'd survive there. They must have tremendous faith, endurance. Africa, Iraq, China, even Israel. I read some time back, uh, some member of parliament there tried to impose a law that it would be illegal to preach the name of Jesus. Well, haven't they read Acts of the Apostles? <laughs> you know, don't they learn history, some of these characters? And in the UK, we don't see persecution, but we see a lot of marginalisation of Christians, don't we? We see a lot of situations that people are hounded and ostracised simply because of their faith. I admire those who even now, standing firm in our country, even at the cost of their job, personal ridicule, and it happens, and you may know people, I may know people, because they uphold the teaching of Scripture. They uphold the teaching of Scripture and refuse to kowtow to the fanciful fashions of the so-called wisdom of man. Yeah? Yeah. In the news you can find these, these incidents. Local news, national news, they're there. Hospital chaplains, sacked for simply doing his job. Lecturers in universities, theological, theology lecturers, sacked for simply teaching scripture, certain issues of scripture. Universities, freedom problem at the moment with freedom of speech. The woman a few weeks ago arrested for simply praying silent in her head. Okay, she was at, she was in a uh, range of an abortion clinic and that was all about. And there were certain rules about all that, but all she did was nothing, nothing. Thought police, as it were, <laughs> hold on. Okay, so much for that. What I think the only thing I can add to that is, let him that readeth understand. The sovereign law of our creator and redeemer does not kowtow to the fickle whims and fancies of mortal man which may be good in its intentions, yes, some of these, these pioneers of change for the improvement of, uh, of social improvement, yes, they have good intentions, We've all, we all have good intentions, but sometimes it's clumsy, and as Mark Twain once said, some people do good in the worst possible way. We see high priests of secular paganism in a way, Similar to this, high priest of secular paganism, just like in Daniel's time, that was paganism. We have Dawkins, he came up a few days ago in a conversation, Richard Dawkins, the, is often referred to as the high priest of atheism. Okay, He's, say high priests of secular paganism. Some of these have probably never read a Bible, never been to church, and they've no idea of what being a Christian is all about. Yet, in their pious their piety, they trample beautiful flower beds just to pull up what they call a few weeds. Daniel exercised trust in faith in God. They refused to bow down to worship. And they, in a way, they exercised what Christians have been doing all along. And it's sometimes labelled as civil disobedience. Sounds, sounds terrible, but it's there. Jesus was accused of civil dis disobedience. The early church was accused of disobedience. And it's nothing new. And I suppose the reason is, often being said, I think there's a, an Irish philosopher, Edmund Burke, an Irishman, who said this, Evil triumphs when good men do nothing. Back to Daniel again. 
So, our challenges, what is our voice? What is our voice? What is our calling? And what hardships are we prepared to put up with? And that's a big one, isn't it? Suffering is part of life, unfortunately. I often get challenged on this sometimes by critics, and they say, well, why is it if God's in control, the world's in such a mess? There's a simple answer to that, if you want it. A simple reply. Is God in control of your life? Because I think if God were in control of our lives more and more, the world in, the, in general, there'd be less hassle. I think if God were in control of how we allow God to be in control of our lives, not just our lives, we're here today as a, as a demonstration of that, the world in general, perhaps things might be a lot better. You see, if we refuse to have him in our lives, why should he turn up when we want him? We've kicked him out of government, we've kicked him out of hospitals, we've kicked him out of education, we've kicked him out of science, and we teach our generation they've all come from monkeys, and then we complain when they act like them. <laughs> yeah? So I'm going to move on quickly, very quickly. So Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. Oh, he's got a right temper, this bloke has. He's always full of fury. I reckon he's a spoiled kid. You can see him stamping about, can't you? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he spoke and commanded them. This is verse 19 onwards. <laughs> he spoke them and he, uh, he ordered that the heat of the furnace be seven times more than it usually was. They probably got seven sets of bellows around or something like that. don't know how they did it. These men were bound in their coats and their trousers and their, their turbans and every other garments. They were bound up, notice, and they were cast into the fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flames of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. These three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the furnace, into the midst of the furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counsellors, Did we not cast three men into the fire? Did we not cast three men into the fire? They answered, Yes. True, O king. Look, he says, look. I see four men, and they're loose. They're loose. They're not bound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they're not hurt. And the form of the fourth one is like the Son of God. Amen. What an epiphany moment for old Neb. When he saw that, God was knocking on his door. Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning furnace, and he spoke and saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here, come out. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire, and the satraps and magistrates, governors, kings, council, and Uncle Tom Cobbley and all, all had, okay, they noticed that there was no, the fire had no effect on them. It had no power on the hair of the head, was not even singed, nor were the garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. And even the loose bounds had been burnt off, but it hadn't burnt the clothes. Amen to that one. Follow that, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed is the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel, dis delivered his servants, and trusted them. They have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies. They should serve and worship any other god except their own god. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar's having a slight change of heart. He is recognising, I better get, I better sign up with this, this God. I better sign up here. Therefore, I make a decree that every in people, uh, sorry, any people, nation, or language which speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, shall be cut into pieces, and their houses shall be made an ash heap, because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Wow, he had an, a chance there, all right. So there's three kinds of faith we get out of this. We get saving faith, 
Ephesians chapter 2, and this, I believe, was offered to Nebuchadnezzar, one of the spark moments, epiphany moments, where he got chance to acknowledge God's sovereignty, where he, he had his, his, his mind and his heart opened, where he had a revelation of who the Saviour was, who, where salvation is. The thing is, we find out later that he compromised, didn't he? He still can say, yeah, I'll worship that God, but we'll still have the other gods as well. Interesting one. Can't mix and match. That was the thing. The other one was the, the gift of faith. The actual gift, the anointing gift of faith. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 9 tells us about the gift of faith that can happen, come up with, can, be, can anoint a person, anoint a Christian in a particular time for a particular purpose where you know that God's going to do something and you step out in faith and it happens. I think it was Smith Wigglesworth knew, he had a strong vision, knew that when he prayed for somebody what was going to happen right down to the last nut and bolt. A man like him who raised the dead 14 times in his life must have known what he was doing. That's the gift of faith and it can, it's, that gift can come upon each and every one of us, according to how the Holy Spirit wishes to, uh, to uh, wishes to do it. Yeah. Daniel exercised the gift of faith. He exercised the gift of faith there in verse 18, 8 verse 17, where he says, I mean, God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. But if not, that's last verse is verse 17, 18 in chapter 3 of Daniel. Yeah. So, then there's the other bit. Get my right notes here. And this, I think, is the part which is more relevant for our daily Christian lives. And it's trusting faith, or what we call enduring faith. Perseverance. That knowing that whatever the outcome, whatever the income, Jesus lives. God's lives any God is there anyway. He is able to bring us through the fire, not necessarily a literal one, but he's able to bring us through the time, whatever, if we keep in with him there. It's often been said, if we can't change the circumstances, change your attitude. And probably that's a little bit to do with it. I know. <laughs> I keep getting told that quite often. Uh, yeah, well, there you go. That's what uh, the, the, the Christian walk's all about, isn't it? Do we focus on the problem? Do we focus on God? It's all that. Trusting God anyway. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The Galatians chapter 5. Enduring faith. Our faith is in God's ability. God's ability, not our our desired result. Our faith is in his ability. I know my Redeemer liveth. I know you can do this. I have faith. Not the desired result that I want. He is ab be abundantly above and beyond what we could hope and imagine. So this kind of faith is God's works according to our wish, but it's his timing. Yes, sometimes he answers prayer, sometimes he doesn't. I think what we've got to avoid sometimes is uh, Christian superstition sometimes with this game. You know, uh, I can always remember a story about somebody who wanted an answer from God, so he opened the Bible, says, right, whatever I say, stick my finger in, that's it. And it says Judas went and hanged himself. And he says, no, that's no good, I'll try another one. And he says, go and do that likewise. You've heard that one, haven't you, before? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so naming and claiming, fine, it's scriptural, but it's not, be careful, it's not presumption either, because that could lead us into a false sense of faith, and we could be terribly have our faith shattered with the naming and claiming business, although it has its place, and I believe it comes in with the gift of faith. So we're working out our salvation. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So what does Daniel teach us? Well, the book of Daniel is authentic and can be relied upon. 
that I'm convinced. It can be relied upon as an accurate, documented account. It's, it's, it's as a historic place in history. You can check it out with the historians, and it's there. If the historic record of Daniel is genuine, then we can also be confident that the prophecies of the end times are also genuine. And the New Testament prophecies are genuine. And the prophecies of Jesus are genuine. If this is so, then we can rest assured that the advice, warning and wishes that it teaches in this book are vital vital lessons our God will deliver us from sickness and disease yes I believe that he is able but if not he will deliver us from loneliness depression or fear but if not our God will deliver us from threats accusations insecurity but if not he will deliver us from death or the loss of loved ones but if not, we will trust the Lord, for I know my Redeemer liveth. Jesus tells us we will have trouble, yes. There will be false Christs, false messiahs, deceivers, charlatans, crooks, vagabonds, wolves, in sheep's clothing and they will probably even deceive even the elect mark 13 and I have warned you beforehand he says so we pray now we pray for Christians right now all over the world in our country and abroad who are facing fiery opposition whatever it is whether it's in the workplace, whether it's physical persecution, torture, or whatever, which threatens their lives, livelihoods, and faith. And we pray, Lord, that they will be able to put on the full armour of God so that when the day of evil comes, they will be able to stand stand and stand their ground and stand our ground and after all that's been done and everything's done stand amen <laughs>